So good morning, everybody. We have Dr. Anthony Neto from uh, NYU. Thank you, Dr. Neto, for coming here. Thank you, guys. And he is Thank going you. to present the slide seminar on GI. GI, yeah, that's Thank it. You. So um, my name is Tony, and um, I'm GI trained um, pathologist. Um, what I have for you today, it's um, just um, our daily basis, you know, like cases. I don't want to treat you or anything. I'm not malignant. I'm very benign. So whatever you want to say, it's it's fine. Don't think that you're saying crazy stuff. It's better to say even if it's wrong. And if I know, I can correct you. And then, you know, and that's the way to remember things. So, and remember that, you know, like for you to learn one thing, people say that, you know, that thing needs to be said at least seven times. I feel now that I'm getting older, seven times is not enough. So you keep like telling me like over and over the same thing on TY Absorb. So uh, maybe you're gonna walk out of this room and say what he just said, but try to remember one thing. If you learn one thing a day, it's fine. So I usually like to give you like a conference. Usually what I do for my residents and fellows is that I put like a theme so I don't go all over the place. If I'm gonna go with the esophagus, I'm gonna go with all the pathology of the esophagus. Uh, I'm gonna go with like new new pleasures of the esophagus. Then I do like infectious disease of the esophagus. So I think it's easier for you to absorb things uh, rather than just do like, you know, intestine, uh, colon, you know, like esophagus and all that, all these kind of things. So anyways, what I have for you here today, it's liver, okay? Um, so, you're gonna tell me if it's neoplastic or not, and then if you figure out that it's neoplastic, then you, you know, by just what I just said to you, probably it's gonna be all neoplastic uh, neoplasias, and if it's infectious, it's gonna be all infectious, whatever it is. Uh, but I'm not gonna tell you. I call someone. Um, if you don't volunteer, I'm just gonna call. But you know, again, I'm not trying to be malignant. Uh, <clears throat> one thing in liver, um, if, um, usually if it's medical or non-medical, one thing that I learned is that. You, um, you're supposed to see the slides first, right? Uh, and then you look at the history. So in other words, um, sometimes I try to be funny, like funny, ha, 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 but I'm, I become like funny, annoying. <laughs> but uh, one thing they say is that if you're full if you look at the history before you see the slides, specific liver, and you're damn full if you sign the case without looking at the history, okay? This is the general approach in pathology. Don't look at the history because you're going to be biased. I know that as a resident, you kind of like feel like I need to finish everything. But you know, um, you start to get addicted uh, to history. And I'm going to tell you, they really can buy, you know, make you biased, you know. So you look at these slides already with the history, you just go into the tubes. You need to know your histology and you have to say, this is brain. I don't care what he tells me. If you if tells me that this is pancreas, this is not. Maybe this is a topic brain in the pancreas, whatever it is. But this is not what it is. You know what I mean? So with that being said, we're gonna start um, with this case. I probably should not uh, said, I should have not told you that this is liver, right? But I think that you all recognize. I'm assuming, right? So the first thing that you have to see in a specimen is on a slide is um, where am I? You have to know your histology and you, you say, okay, I am in the liver. So then you start to put your diagnosis together, okay? This is the easiest way to approach. So I, I kind of tell my residents, do your layers. Layers are not, not like from the top to the bottom, like you have like an aluminum GI for everything. My layers in this specimen, what I see here, I see pink stuff, you know, like pink cells, hexagonal, what is the arrow here, um, here. And I have these, you know, sinusoids, you know, I have some um, uh, inflammatory cells here. I try to look for um, uh, the triad, right, the phototracks, then I say it's liver. So the next step is, is this neoplastic or non-neoplastic? So for every slide, that's what you have to do. So um, if I see something like this, what do you think? Do you think this is neoplastic or non-neoplastic? Uh oh, it's out of focus because my eyes are messed up also, but um, I'm going to go to high power. Somebody said something. Don't be afraid. Just shut up. Neoplastic. Yeah. Why you say that? Because the size of the nucleus is different. Uh-huh. And uh, there's a little crowding and they're not in shape. Okay. Uh, it's not forming exactly. Uh-huh. 
Okay, it's a good d description. And you can say that, you know, like for instance, always compare with things around, right? The liver here, it's normal, right? And, um, God, we're gonna have a problem here because I can't multitask. Um, so compare the two tissue, there is a distinction, right? Between this area here um, and this one, right? So there is a proliferation of something here. So most likely it's neoplastic. Um, specifically because like I'm telling you, like for the things that you described and for these things here that we have, this is pretty much normal tissue. But then next week you have something that it's kind of funny. And again, not funny, ha ha ha, right? Funny, peculiar. So, and uh, you have something which is nested and you have some variation size of the nuclei also. Um, some of the cells do have some prominent nucleoli. I mean, not that much, but you know, you have something here. Um, so the next step is if you found out if you're uh, comfortable calling these neoplastic, the next step is, is this uh, epithelial or mesenchymal? So what is a um, um, very rapid way, a fast way of distinguish between epithelial and mesenchymal? Cytotherapy? I'm sorry? Oh, you mean staining? No, no, not staining, oh, like morphological. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm also deaf. I was telling Rifat I had a cold, and I'm, after this cold, I became deaf from to this to. Well, anyways, this yeah, is too much information, but just when I keep saying, like, what, what, you know already, it's because of my cold that I had. Um, so, anyways, uh, not, not immunohistochemically, just, uh, just one thing in mind do not jump into IFCs. You have to make your assessment on HNE. The IFCs will help you once you make your mind, and then you go for your three positive and three negative things. But don't start like jumping into that because you're gonna you're gonna get hurt. Okay, it's good to use IFCs, but you need to be comfortable with your HNEs first. So, what is a, a, a fast way of differentiating, you know, epithelial neoplasm versus mesenchymal? I'm not even talking about malignant epithelial versus malignant mesenchymal. So morphologically, uh, epithelial neoplasm, neoplasm, they look like, like this. They're like, they're, they're nested, they're all together, they're making all the cells, they look like almost like if it was an epithelium type of thing, right? So versus mesenchymal, which is a spindle, right? And they're all over the place. So they kind of don't stick together, right? So this is one of the, you know, fastest way to do it. Of course, you have your sarcomas also that can be like epithelioid and, and, and also the other way around. You have carcinomas that can be like, you know, like sarcomatoid carcinomas and the ice finger, right? But as a general rule, that's what you have to find. You find nests, right? Cells sticking together. I'm not talking about pretty differentiated carcinoma, things like that. The next step for malignancy, once you define this is malignant, what is the most, um, uh, once you define this is, uh, yeah, malignant, like uh, epithelial or mesenchymal, what is the number one criteria for invasion? <clears throat> Not for invasion. I just give you the answer for malignancy, invasion. Uh, yeah, sometimes my you know my tongue doesn't follow my brain. Uh, so that would be the most important criteria. Once you feel that this is you know invasive with dysplasia and all that, this is malignant, right? One thing also you have to think also is in terms of invasion. Usually you have this vascular um, proliferation, right? In carcinomas, the, the the vessels they are proliferating between nests, okay? Um, and in sarcoma, it's all over the place. So if you have vessels they are like in the nest or outside, most specifically, this is most likely an epithelial origin. And if you have vessels all over the place, also like cells, is mesenchymal. And I'm saying that because you're gonna be full. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell if this is malignant, if this is a neoplastic process, if this is malignant, and if this is mesenchymal or epithelial, I'm not even talking about your lymphomas, your melanomas, your neuroendocrine tumors. This is another category. But the best, the two things, the way to approach would be these two, epithelial, mesenchymal, uh, benign, or malignant, okay? So anyways, uh, again, this is um, a liver, and it looks like that it's making all these nests, right? And um, do you think this is benign or malignant? And if it's benign, you know, you have to come up with a differential diagnosis here. And if it's malignant, it's going to be probably, in a way, easier, right? Uh, to tell. So what do you think? Is this benign or malignant? 
Malignant. Malignant. Yeah. So if it's malignant, uh, what is the first thing that you think? Is this a primary or metastatic uh, tumor in the liver? So what do you think? The first thing comes to your mind. Primary. Metastatic. metastatic. Yeah. So the most common neoplasm in the liver, the malignant, will be metastatic, right? And the other thing is, like for instance, if it would be primary, then um, you're, you're talking about HCCs, right? And HCC usually occur in the, occur in the uh, background of cirrhosis. What is the only situation, maybe one of the few situations in which you have HCC and it's it's not um, related to cirrhosis? What kind of tumor? Fibrolamellar. Yes, fibrolamellar, right? So then, you know, in this case, it's not a fibrolamellar, you know, we don't have all the features that we would like to. Uh, so um, anybody wanna say anything about this, this case? So now we know that it's a, most likely a metastatic tumor um to deliver and uh now the next step is like is this a woman or this is, now that's when you start like getting you know sometime um you know in, in order for you to worry your stains you need to know some information but if you don't have any information you're obliged also to order here like hepa one because you don't know if this is a you know hcc or not sometimes you do have hccs like you know we're very well differentiated with this nas and they are kind of almost like blend because it's got like a almost like a blend appearance right to the tumor so you should also uh, order stains. So wh which stains do you want to order here? <clears throat> so let me just cut this uh, a little bit short. Um, this is a female patient. Wow, it's just like boom, got it. <laughs> that was good. And it, you're going to save a lot of money for the patient because you're just going like, boom, I don't need anything else. Give me got it, goodbye, next, right? So yeah, I think that you know you have to think first. You know, um, breasts, right? You think about breasts. So when did you get a get a three? But um, yeah, uh, one thing that I do for liver. What are the most two common tumors to metastasize to the liver? Colorectal and lung. So I always do my. You know, it's almost like my checklist. Remember that ideally you would have like three uh, positive and three negatives, right, for new immune stains to be complete, a nice workup. You have to have like three markers that is positive and three markers that are negative, so you exclude, you know, whatever it is, a differential diagnosis. Yeah, sometimes we go like over the board, you know, and start like ordering too many, many stains. It's wrong. If you're sitting with an attendee that start right, you know, ordering like 10, 15, just walk away because mm -hmm. you're not gonna learn anything from this person. <laughs> you know, it's dangerous, it is dangerous. You start look, you start like, you know, asking your second batch when you first stop looking. You can't, because it, it, it's going to be very confusing for you, for the the, 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 the attending, for the, the patient, it's dangerous. So, I mean, a batch should be like, you know, five, six things or more than that, you know. You cannot go, oh, you put like all the entire book there and order like a panel of 30 stains, it's crazy. So anyways, um, sometimes you have to because you have no history and you know, they look like nothing, but you know, like go away from patient, you know, attendees that are doing this. So you said gather three, you wanna save a lot of money. I was trying to get, you know, like tons of stains here, but you know, hey, you smart and, <laughs> and you said, you kind of embarrass me here because I pull all these six, seven stains here and you just said, why you need all of these, like, right? So this is GATA3, okay? Uh, they did not know that this patient had a breast history. But again, you know, um, without knowing the history, you have to think of everything. That nest, you know, nested cells with pink cytoplasm kind of bland, also think about squamous cell carcinoma, okay? Urothelial carcinomas. Every time you have something that it looks like squamous, automatically also think about urothelial. And something that it looks urothelial, think about squamous cell carcinoma. They kind of, you know, look alike. Squamous cell carcinoma also can um, sometimes be nasty, like melanomas and renal cell carcinoma. They have, you know, different features, even making glands and all that. So always having liver also work up for squamous cell carcinomas, urothelial carcinomas, and all that. But again, you know, it's a female, you know, the first thing you think is a breast, even got a three, next, and go away. 
Uh, actually, it's not like this. You want also to do your ER, PR, you know, some other things that, again, you know, you're three positive. Uh, it's always advisable. Um, yeah, so I don't think I have to. Now you kind of embarrass me because I don't have to show, you know, the others. But I'm going to tell you, uh, ER positive, PR positive, CK7 positive, um, and that's your, your breast pattern, right? One thing that I want to tell you is that I have seen people looking at, so GATA3, what is a GATA3? In terms of stains, is this a, um, I'm putting back here. Um, say, it, say it again. It's a nuclear thing that's what you want to Yeah, yeah. So why it's this nuclear thing? Because it's transcription factor, right? And I'm saying that because I've seen cases and probably um, I, I didn't, I, I, myself, I did the same thing. I, I forgot that this was a nuclear staining, not this case, some other transcription factor. And I called positive, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm thinking, God is so good to me that uh, before I sign out, I look at it again, and I was like, Oh my God, this is cytoplasm this time. And um, the transcription transcription factors they are nuclear staining. So I was going to call positive. I saw recently um, some attendees, you know, they got caught into this and 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 excluded the diagnosis or called, you know, positive based on nuclear staining. So one thing that I'm telling you, know the pattern of immune stains. It's so important because then, first of all, look at the uh, controls, right? Which most of us, we forget to do it. And some uh, institutions, they don't even have the control there, right? Which is kind of dangerous. But look at your control. Sometimes I forget to, to, to look at control. Or sometimes I look at the control. Not sometimes, I shouldn't be say that specifically live but you know i had like two cases that i call positive h pylori just because i look at the control and and i i, I completely ignore the tissue and i said uh positive for helicobacter gas think it was only helicobacter gas right? well i probably costed some money for the patient you know and, and prevented prevented some h pylori but you know i called positive and i was like oh my god so it's kind of like um you know it, you have to have your step by step you know you have to be obsessive compulsive um, in pathology, because this is about if you take obsessive compulsive disorder into your personal life, then you're miserable. But you know, in pathology, you have to do it. You have to do step by step. So be careful with these things. You need to know the pattern of staining, because um, uh, if you don't, you're gonna uh, fall through the cracks. You know what I mean? You're gonna go into the tubes very fast, and you go to jail. People are not gonna visit you there. They're gonna let you there. So, anyways, this is you know um, a good case and simple case. Um, that you know everybody should uh, always work up. If it's a female, you go with this, you know, uh, breast, gynecological, exclude the other tumors, colon and, and, and lung. This is the most common, okay? Um, again, know your pattern of stain. Do not forget that. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna tell you things here, ad nausea and ad vomitum, specifically because we're in GI. So it's gonna be over and over and over until you feel like nauseated there. Uh, don't vomit, but you know, you can just, if you feel nauseated, just tell me to stop. And if I'm annoying you, just tell me that Tony, you know, you annoy me. It's it's okay. Oh, you know, I, I was told that before. So, okay. Oh, they tell me. They tell me. My residents and 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 I, we have a good relation. It's very honest and sincere. Sometimes we go like, can you just shut up and and, and do the work? It's fine. It's okay. They are very cool. I love them. Um, so, again, um, where are we? Liver, right? Because today it's liver. <laughs> so, just because of that, right? And then we have something here. Not you anymore. You can't say anything anymore. No, I'm just joking. For now. Next case. Who's going to take this one? Huh? Yeah, that's a reticulin stain because, you know, the H&E broke yesterday and I couldn't fix it. But, uh, yeah, it's a reticulin stain. Good. It's a good. So then, you know, you recognize that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this area doesn't look like a, it's not a normal pattern here. And, yeah, there's some really uh, large and bizarre cells. So this looks like an uh, invasive one, Is there a So you're already saying that it's malignant? Right, because it's invasive. Can you tell if this is epithelial or a mesenchymal? Uh, Based on everything that we probably discussed before, right? Yeah. 
Okay. probably should speed it up a little bit more because I have tons of kids to show you guys and I want to show them all even if it's done kind of fast but uh any any guess there at this point do you think this is so again you kind of um, you, 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 you're doing your checklist you, you, you kind of decided that this is um, malignant epithelial tumor. In other words, this is a carcinoma. So the point being here is that, is this primary or metastatic, right? Again, so that that's the next step. Have you decided or you haven't, or you want to have, you know, all these things to separate, or you're convinced that this is um, HCC, you just need to get your HEPAR1 to confirm, and then next step, negative, let me, do, let me see what I'm going to do next step. So what do you want to do? Just, just you know, like as if you were like looking at the case. What would you do? So I mean, uh, yes, maybe metastatic. Um, Could this be HCC? I know that you don't have, uh, we don't have the HNE here, but could this be HCC? Or you would expect not to be HCC? Not enough. Not enough. Okay, fair. So let me show you the HEPAR one. So if you're looking at HCCs um, in the liver and outside of the liver, most likely outside of the liver, what is the thing that you would like to see in a cell so that you say, hmm, I think this is HCC, I'm gonna order my HEPAR one. Let's assume that this is a lung and you see that tumor that it's like, you know, pinkish, ovoid, all the features of one of these um, you know, the liver, like HCC, and you say, you know what, I see something here, I'm convinced that this is, or you wanted to impress the resident or the fellow and you say, see this? This is HCC because of this. So what would you do? Now, you guys are jumping into the stains. Remember that it's morphology. Everything is about morphology. The endothelial lining of the nest. Well, it's it's a good it's a good thing, um, but not always. You're gonna have that endothelial lining with the CD30. Well, you know, before you do the CD34, you kind of see, but it's a good point in terms of cells. Prominent neutralis. But this can be seen in everything, right? Kind of like I mean, yeah, prominent neutralis help you also may may help you, but not really. There's one thing that you would see that would help you when you say that's. That's HCC. I don't care what anybody HCC says. Bile? Yes, yes. H, uh, uh, bile production is only done by HCC. That's it. So if you see bile, if you see cells with green stuff, not not your brown stuff, hemosiderin or anything else, bile. This is HCC is the only one that's going to produce that, and you can impress anybody. You just say, give me HEPAR one. This is for her. She's like a one saying, and that's it. <laughs> I don't have time for that, right? <laughs> so it's like, give me HEPAR1, pause it. But if HEPAR1 is negative and you go like, wow, you know, I tried to impress the resident and now it's negative, what am I gonna do? So how are you gonna explain this to the resident? So how are you gonna say that? That it's negative and you say, but it's still, this is HCC. And I'm gonna prove to you. No, I'm saying, what is the next? Well, it could be, okay, okay. It could be, but that's that's not um, that. Um, well, you're you're partially right, but there is one thing else that you can say. You know that you know 10, 15 percent, maybe even more, can be HEPAR1 negative, right? There's also sampling could be some other area that is positive and this area is negative, but some of the tumors HCC can be negative, right? So then, what do you do? The next step is arginase. Get an arginase. You know, and this is going to be probably most likely positive. So then you come to the resident and say, here, listen, you didn't get me. Here it is, your resident. <laughs> this is HCC, I don't care, right? So that's the way to do it. So always think about, remember that, you know, also stains. Stains are only sensitive and specific in three months. After three months, somebody out there, oh, I did a studies in blah, 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 and they're also positive for blah, 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 right? And then, you know, all your theory about HEPAR1 being positive, it goes down in the tubes. So be careful with that. That's what I'm saying. Morphology is very important. So you have your, you know, again, your positives and your negatives. Anything can be stained for anything. So everything is looking at in a context, right? So anyways, uh, this is your HEPAR1. Uh, tumor is negative. 
I don't have an arginase, but arginase is negative. Uh, meaning like in my mind. Um, so there is one stain here that was ordered because in that case, we had a history. The, the um, prior uh, case, we didn't have a history. We made the diagnosis of breast. She was checked. There was a breast lesion. This case is <clears throat> this is What What can you tell? This is not moving now. This is ecadherin. So for what tumors do you do that? Breast, right? So it was invasive ductal breast carcinoma. The patient had a history. Uh, she had also her to new uh, positive ER and PR. So ER and PR were both positive. Uh, we did, you know, like um, um, 720 and was the typical pattern. I think we did also uh, got it. Actually, we didn't do it, so sorry, so I've got it. Uh, we don't have got it this time, but probably we should ask them to do it. So anyways, ER, PR, TTF1 negative again. So this is a female. I'm just telling you because the other one was very bland, right? The first one. This one was kind of like more uh, the malignant, meaning like the malignant, meaning like more pleomorphic and all that. So uh, don't, don't just let... The other one for you just because it's very bland and you're expecting, you know, like a like an ugly type of thing with bizarre cells like this one, like you described, it's more, you know, the cells and all that. So tumors can come in different shape and form, right? So this is, um, again, a um, breast carcinoma, uh, patient with a history already. Um, I think the patient also had a history of, uh, thank you so much, uh, lung lesions. So, which make you think that this could be lung, and then the TTF1 was negative. Uh, TTF1 is positive in what kind of lung tumors? Adenocarcinomas, exactly. Um, what kind of, um, what, what other tumor? Thyroid, but in the lung also, what? Small, Small exactly. So, is TTF1 positive in, um, Myriad of tumors from all the sites. Mm -hmm. No, yes, uh, no, yes, okay. um, yes, yes. Um, they they are positive. Uh, to have one usually usually is positive in myriad of tumors, in, even in the high grade myriad of carcinomas. So every time you have a new endocrine tumor, if you do a TTF1, don't assume that this is long because it's positive for TTF1. They are usually positive, okay? Um, and if they are not, also do not exclude, you know, lung, you know. So it's always like in the context also. So let me start with some cool cases here. I don't know, I mean, I think I love pathology. So to me, like even the, simple, the most simple case, it's cool. So um, that's, that's the way I see things when people say, oh, this is just a simple gallbladder. You're always gonna find something there, believe me. If you're really, really to learn something, you're always gonna find. So I'm not trying to lecture you and say, oh yeah, do not, don't need, you know, it's like um, telling me what to do. No, no, it's not that. It's just, I think that pathology is fantastic because of that. You just always learn something new. So talking about, uh, so assume that when we don't see liver, this is liver. It's just because, you know, I didn't have the liver tissue. Uh, most of it, it's like tumor, um, like in certain cases that I'm gonna show here. So let me just take this away so that I can, <clears throat> Does anybody want to get this one? If I stop, right? I don't. If I, you need to time me, tell me exactly what time, how many minutes I have, because I have tons of cases here, and I want to show. Oh, it's there. I have thirty minutes. Okay, so let's let's move on. This is just um, a simple, probably kind of straightforward type of case. So this is liver. I'm not telling you any history. Tell me at this low power view what kind of tumor you would fit. Let's assume that now they're all malignant, okay? They're all metastatic. They're all like coming from somewhere else. Um, one thing, boom. Where is, oh, the lady, the one uh, thing, the <laughs> one slide, one lady, one diagnosis, that's it, she's gone. But uh, let's let's assume that you have only one shot, right? 
like for me that I practice in the third, I used to practice in the third world. I'm from Brazil. We don't, we can't afford all of this. Then you have to get one stay and then two stays and that's it. You have to make your diagnosis, whether it's right, right or wrong. So I hope that we all right there. But anyways, if you have one slide, uh, one stain to order here. Yes. So don't jump into the small cell carcinoma. First, come like meaning like you're right. I'm not trying to to, to like you know um, cut you. It's just saying like it's a new endocrine tumor, right? It's the best approach because sometimes it's going to be what if it's not if it's a new endocrine tumor, a carcinoma can be a large cell, right? So when you say small cell, you close the door to other things. Right, I mean, um, I mean, probably you're right because you know this is kind of like small. Remember also that I, I, I made a mistake. I even brought the case. I called urinary carcinoma with features of large cell, and it was a small cell. Uh, hopefully, you know, nothing happened with the patient, or kind, of, you know, I, I amended right away. But I favor large cell when it was not large cells, and I don't know why I wrote that because looking at the case, I was like, I don't see features of large cell here. Okay, so again, this is a new endocrine because it's what? It's too blue, right? If it is too blue, it's bad. If it is too blue, it might be some the blue cell tumor, right? The small blue cell tumors. Uh, new endocrine tumors, what else anymore you think about? When you think about um, small blue cell? Lymphoma. Yes. Could this be a lymphoma? Likely. Unlikely? Yeah, that's less likely, what? I guess, because it is. There is some clustering still, so it's not too diffuse. There is more cytoplasm than we think in a lymphoma. Yes, yes. That's a perfect approach. And that's what you have to do. It. When you look at all this, you're going to say, well, my DKN show is that, that, and that. But I'm excluding this because of that, and that. Just like you said, this is perfect. This is what I call the layers. You do your layers. You you, you know exactly what you're looking at. So uh, this is not lymphoma, but if somebody insists, specifically clinician, you're going to have to drop, you know, to put it at a CD45 there, right? Uh, just remember that if you have a CD45, if you're thinking about lymphoma, and if you have a CD45, then it's negative. Do not let this stop you, because some of lymphomas, they lose their capability of staining for CD45. So go ahead and do your CD3 or CD20, okay? So always think that, oh, yeah, this is negative. I'm not going to, you know, go to the next step. So you think that it's an endocrine uh, tumor because you kind of like described also, right? Everything that you have here kind of molding, you know, like this. Um, do you see? Um, so this, again, um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you the... So if it is neuroendocrine tumor, uh, so what do you think? Is this a small or a large cell? Huh? Small. Okay. So if it was large, what features would you like to see to call large? Uh huh. <laughs> Can a small cell be large cell? Have have large cells? Yes. Yes. So it's the large cell, small cell, right? <laughs> I usually say because it's like the large cell is large cell. But the small cell, you can have the old, remember the old cell carcinoma, that's how they used to call, but you may have large cells. But what's the, the, the number one feature for you to call large cells? There are probably two or three features, but you know, the number one feature for you to call large cells from a nuclear line, you're not gonna see this as small cell carcinoma, the typical, uh, whether it's a large cell, small cell. <laughs> You're not going to see that. So look it for for um, um, nucleoli, from a nucleoli, and also cytoplasm. Remember the small cell carcinomas, they are molding, right? They don't have that. So uh, this is a TTF1. So is this positive? It is positive, right? Is this long? Not necessarily, not necessarily right? So this is uh, I'm a hard time with it. This is twenty. Is this positive? Yeah. If I can focus right. Oops. It is, right? Can we go one higher? Yes. Right? 
So is it with CD20, right? C CK20, CK20, I'm sorry. Did it say CD20? CK20. So it's kind of like focally positive, but it is positive. Uh, then I have. Um, CK7, which is strongly positive, right? So CK20 was focally positive. Uh, do I think about lung in that case? Most likely not, right? But it could be. So 7 and 20, then we went back. This patient had a history, not in our institution, in an outside institution of a rectal carcinoma. So it would make, remember that 7 and 20 also can be positive? In, colon, in rectal colony and specifically rectal. So then this was a um, saprophase and chromogranin, they were both positive. Uh, so this was consistent with a uh, rectal uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma. So again, um, <clears throat> for liver, you do need sometimes to get your uh, history. Okay, so. This had TTF1 positive also, right? So they they are TTF1. Or... So neuroendocrine yeah. tumors and um, not only that, high-grade neuroendocrine tumors, they are often positive for TTF1, okay? Um, I have 20 minutes and I have probably 20 more cases. No, I'm kidding. Um, that's, I'm gonna go through some. Again, this is liver. <clears throat> Do you think this looks, looks like anything that I showed you already? Yeah, first case. The first case, exactly. If I can put it this slide on the screen, that would be good. Um, the first case, right? So remember, what did I say as differential diagnosis when I was mentioning? Um, urothelium. Yes. So what is a good thing for urothelial carcinoma, like in terms of cellular changes? Um, so the, let me just cut short also. The normal urothelium usually you see groupings, right? Like you see the grooves, right? Uh, this is an indication that you're kind of dealing with um, urothelial um, uh, origin. Uh, sometimes, uh, urothelial carcinomas, they also do have groupings. Of course, there are other tumors that you will see groupings. Uh, tell me one, uh, GYN tract. Granulosa. Yes, granulosa cell tumor, right? Some of the small cell carcinoma, the hypercalcemic type also, will give these groupings also. Okay, uh, but urethelium, it's, it's commonly, when you look at the, the urethelium, the normal urethelium, you're gonna see grooves there. Uh, sometimes, again, the tumor, you know, urethelial carcinomas do have grooves. I kind of try to find some grooves. Every time I see mess in liver and things like that, I try to, uh, urethelial carcinoma comes to my mind because it's a common place also for urethelial carcinoma to go. I couldn't find anything there. There's nothing else that I could really, you know, make me think of uh, uh, urethelial carcinoma. So as part of the workup, you know, we did the, um, the for the GATA resident, <laughs> uh, we did it. And remember, GATA, it's usually good for breast and uh, urethelium, right? So I forgot, I'm sorry, I didn't ask your name. Yeah. GATA. <laughs> ah, I knew it. <laughs> Say again? Laura. Laura, okay. Laura got it. Uh, so here it is for Laura. Uh, this is a uh, GATA3, and it's nice because it's, you know, look at staining and all that. Uh, we do have some other stains like CK20 and 7. So CK20 and 7, how would you expect to be in your... If I ask you, give me a, a typical tumor that is 7 and 20 positive, which tumor would come to your mind first? Urethelial carcinoma, right? This is the typical pattern, okay? Do you know exactly, like in, in benign epithelium, in benign urethelium, uh, where seven stains and 20? 20 is only the umbrella cells. Yes, and seven. Seven should be negative. But, you know, they say it's negative, but, you know, my experience is that, well, they don't say it's, it's, it's negative. My experience is that seven stains the other part, never the umbrella. But you know the other parts of the epithelium, the intermediate and the basal cell, you may have seven. The way of remember the uh, twenty being umbrella cells is that you know uh, somebody told me and I thought that was uh, cool. If you were in the rain, would you rather have seven or twenty umbrellas? Twenty. So then that's that, that's how it you know stuck to my mind. And I was like, that's cool because I always got like, everything confused. So now you know that you know you have twenty. So seven and twenty, it's positive. It's a good thing um, for you to 
to make your diagnosis. See, again, you know, we didn't need to go with too many stains here to do that, but the 7 and 20 and GATA was positive. So, um, so that was a good um, call. Uh, sometimes you need to get more stains, specifically if you don't know exactly where you're going. So this is the next uh, um, tumor. And again, it's liver, right? And again, it's metastatic. And again, they look all the same, right? So basically, again, um, <clears throat> if you want to describe that like quickly, just give me, you know, like something and give me a differential and what you want to wear. I'm kind of like doing everything I need to ask you guys. So, um, oops, this is not a good area. Is this thing shaking there? Mm. You think I'm crazy by now, right? But you're right. Um, <laughs> what do you think about this? Quickly describe the cells, give me a differential diagnosis, give me a stain. What is that? You have to shout because remember, I'm deaf. Yeah. This is shaking. See, I'm not doing anything, I promise. I'm not touching. It's a camera. It's a camera, okay. It looks like the inclusions. Yeah, it looks like inclusions. Yeah. Maybe that Yeah, could be. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, this is one of those that, you know, we needed to go to, we got like seven stains, so it's, it was one more than the, the panel <laughs> for you to walk away from the, the attending, right? <laughs> but it was because of all the features that you're saying, you know, we're kind of like, oh, uh, is this gland or this is pseudogland, you know, they have some prominent nucleoli, I mean, uh, nuclear inclusions, you know, they're kind of pink. Remember, squamous cell carcinoma can have all of these also. You know, thyroid also can be. So then you kind of like you go with, um, hey, this and what would be the pattern here? Uh, what would be the first batch of stains? So, uh, and again, um, every time that you see something that is pinkish, is squamoidish, which I think that this could look like squamoid, right? Like a little bit. I mean, if you push, then automatically you think about your urethelial carcinoma. So again, we order, um, you know, the uh, CK7, CDX2, uh, NKX3.1, this is a male, and why we ordered NKX3.1? Prostate. For prostate. So um, does this look like prostate? Not, but you know, some of the glands, you know, they're there, and then you want to order, and then you go with the 20. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a weird one because CK7 and 20 were negative, right? And then we go like, huh, um, nothing positive here, not seven, not 20. What is the next step? So somebody came in, came in and said, oh, this looks like urethelium. It was like, okay, it looks like urethelium. Okay, let's get GATA, right? <laughs> so GATA now it's like, you know, the, the savior. <laughs> it looks like, and it's, it's a guy. Um, this is not a female. See how everything can be deceptive? Uh, and this is one of the few situations in which you have to rely on your stains. Because remember from the beginning, I said HME, 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 three times until you get to your immune stains. You need to be comfortable with your HME, your morphology. And this is a, case, a situation that your HME didn't help at all because it couldn't fit in anything. You only know that this is a carcinoma, you just don't know what type, then you're 7 and 20, it's negative, and you go crazy because, like, hey, <laughs> which tumor? I mean, you, you wouldn't think about, about your theory because when I asked what is the number one CK7 and 20 positive, you said your theory, and this is true. This is the, the tumor that should come to your mind. But somebody walks in and says, well, it looks like your theory. and then you have to listen to this person because maybe he or she is right, right? And it was. So GATA3 was positive, which is uh, great. 
right? And um, everything else in terms of uh, 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 P63 and uh, all the other markers were negative. And then you call the clinician, which is not in the, you know, in the, in the uh, file uh, or in the chart, and they say, yeah, this patient had a history of um, some sort of uh, transitional cell carcinoma. And you go nuts because you spend <laughs> like three, four days trying to figure this out. And when it's there, right? I mean, yeah, you just, right. if you had given a call to the clinician, probably, you know, would have made your life uh, less miserable. But again, always think about your urethelial carcinoma. I'm not joking. It, it's going to fool you if you don't think about your urethelial carcinoma when you see this pinkish, nested, you know, thing that looks like HTC, squamous, urethelium. They are all the same. They look alike very much. Uh, this is a uh, simple, straightforward, and I'm going to go, I have uh, 10 minutes, and I wanted to, to do three, four cases that I think it's straight. Um, this is your typical something. So just, you know, this time I'm not going to ask you to describe. I'm just going to ask you to give me a diagnosis. Colon. Colon. Why is that? Now I'm not going to ask you to describe. Colon formation and uh, preclinicosis. Yes. So if this was a female. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to take this out because seven uh, is negative, 20 is positive, CDX2 is it's positive. But if this was a female and seven was positive and 20 was negative. Yes. So uh, before stains, the two things that will give this dirt necrosis type of tumor, glands associated with dirt necrosis, dirt necrosis, my accent is getting thicker and thicker. Uh, uh, would be endometrioid and colonic. That's the two things. You know, when somebody you know walks in with this type of tumor, that's the first thing that you have to think. And then you say, is this a female? You say yes, then endometrioid next. Not even stains this time. Uh, I'm being cheaper than you. <laughs> you wanna save it? Then let's see who's gonna beat who, right? <laughs> so this is also a cool case because um, just to show you uh, again, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do next is try to find the field here. Uh, I'm sweating here because I sweat a lot so through my hands, so I'm kind of having difficulty moving this stage. But um, again, is this animal carcinoma or not? If you see at this power. Yes. It is. Do you have dirt necrosis? No. So kind of like exclude colon, right? But still, it could be colon, right? I mean, it can always be colon. Um, but I don't think uh, this is a cool one. I'm going to show this one, and I'm going to move to this side. I'll tell you exactly, OK? Um, any any guess here? It doesn't matter if it's a male or female. Lung would be TTF1 is negative. So let me tell you, this is a 7 um, positive and a 20 positive. No, I'm sorry. A CDX2 positive and 20 negative. Uh, seven, uh, seven positive, right? And 20 negative. I mean, it could be, but chances are. Uh, and what is the, the next one? Upper GI, right? Yeah, which include also includes um, esophagus. But your report, if you have no history, seven positive. 20 negative, CDX2 positive, upper GI and yeah, pancreatic BDRA. Okay, so that's how your report goes. This is an animal carcinoma, seven positive, uh, 20, I mean, uh, seven positive, 20 negative, CDX2 positive, upper GI, pancreatic BDRA. This patient had a history of a pancreatic cancer. Um, I want to show, I have. Eight minutes. Can we do like four kids in eight minutes? We're gonna do it. Again, liver. <laughs> Why I keep saying this liver? You guys all know that it's liver. <laughs> it's because I get excited. Uh, again, um, <laughs> this is adenocarcinoma. carcinoma. Adeno carcinoma, right? Female. I'm not going to go with I'm you know, trying to fool you guys. Uh, yeah, endometrium. Yeah, it could be endometrium 
also, definitely. It's not the usual pattern, but yeah, it could be endometrial, always, right? It's a female gynecologic tract. Um, if I tell you that it's uh, CK7 positive and 20 negative, and it's um, PAX8, excuse me. <clears throat> so PAX8 is positive. PAX is a transcription factor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's positive. God, how miserable I am here when I try to do things in a in a rush. I can't even find the tissue. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> it's not here. What is that? <laughs> no. Here. Oh, here. So PAX8, positive. So PAX8 is usually good for what kind of tumors? What else? Thyroid? Thyroid. Mm -hmm. And renal cell carcinoma. So these are the three, right? So this is a female. Does it look like renal cell carcinoma? No. No clear cells, right? Does it look like thyroid? No, no right? So you're left with the ovary, right? What kind of ovarian tumors usually? So PAX8, seven positive, um, ER positive, you know, telling that it's uh, most likely an ovarian uh, joint tract, 20 uh, negative. So what kind of ovarian, ovarian tumors, mucinous, they are seven and 20 positive, right? non mucinous, they are seven positive, 20 negative. So this is a serious adenocarcinoma because also PAX8, right? So the, uh, this, Pax8, they're good for all these uh, epithelial, uh, ovarian, tubal, and peritoneal surface because remember they're coming from the salomic uh, epithelium that gives rise to the paramesonephric ducts or mullerian ducts, which uh, in, in biologically, you know, uh, covers the surface of the ovaries, also give rise to the tubes, the, his, uh, the uterus, cervix, and upper vagina. So all these tumors, they are coming from these paramesonephric or mullerian ducts. They are all PAX8 positive, okay? So have this in mind also, which makes us like, make me irritated because I need to go back to my histology, like the very embryological thing that it's like literally dead by now. But you know, you have to recover it and you know, resurface all this information to understand what you order, right? Because otherwise it's like, you know, why am I ordering this kind of things? So it's a pain in the pot because you kind of like don't want to go back to all this you know knowledge that you acquire like way back, but you need that to understand exactly what you're doing. So females also um, think always gynecologic tract, right? And know your specific. You don't need to know everything, like but you know know the specific things that you're gonna do. I have five more minutes. I need to do this case here. This is a very cool case. Um, and I wanted to fool you. I literally want it because this is probably the most beautiful. Well, there's another one which is really good. Look how many slides. So, are you guys okay or I'm like boring you or something? That you can be honest. Yeah. Okay. Be like my residents, be, you know, blunt and tell me in the face. <laughs> So this is a very cool case, very, very nice. <clears throat> and this brings me into all these, all the checklists that you have to have for these type of things. First of all, first of all, okay, so we're talking about all, they're not, they're non benign. <laughs> the point here that so far we had all carcinomas, right? Everything was epithelial origin. So now we're moving to the spindling or um, not so spindling, but no so carcinoma, not an epithelial tumor. But again, forget about what I just told you. Always, in, even if you're comfortable thinking that this is a spindle cell lesion, always put it like, um, like a keratin. Like you can do your A1, A3 or CAN 5.2. Some people are obsessed with CAN, uh, CAN 5.2. I'm obsessed with uh, uh, A1A3 and Mach 31. For everything, it's Mach 31. It, there's no, not even need 
for Mach 31 and I throw in a Mach 31 <laughs> because it's like almost like, no, I, if, without a Mach 31, I cannot do anything, right? So I'm trying to get detached from that. But um, tell me, how would you work this up? First of all, <laughs> do you think that this reminds you of anything at all? Or is it just like a bunch of cells there? It's like in background. Do you think it's clear cell or just the background? Well, I would buy it. It could be clear cell. Somebody told me also clear cell. I didn't think of this. I couldn't I couldn't make anything. I just felt that you know they were like some spindly. Some of them were not, they were just round, very epidioidish but not at the old, you know what I mean? Like not not your usual carcinoma. And has this background, say, say again. Yeah, no, no, like remind something like a mesothelium or something. It could, it could. Or even a yeah. rare, something like a cordoma. I don't know about exactly. Yeah, I had um, many cordomas. Yeah, it could be Cordoma, some mixed like, sardish yeah. also, yeah. So now you're kind of like thinking this is definitely not a video, right? It's more of a missing or anything. So what do you want to order? So okay, it came five point two negative CK. Um, S one hundred. S one hundred negative. I'm not going to be showing you all of these because then we it's nine o'clock. I need to show you two more Melanie cases. Okay, uh, Melanie. Uh, do you know what Melanie was was not done, but it was negative. Okay. <laughs> So S100 was uh, negative. Uh, Caldesimum, SMA, desmin, negative. Why is that? Because when you see things like this in the liver, there are certain things that you have to think. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you three, Rem just remember one at least, or two, okay? Every time you see some a mesenchymal spindle, spindle cell lesion, specifically spindle cell lesion, think of melanoma and GIST. Not necessarily this order. Um, any time that you see any kind that it's spindle and it's malignant, think about melanoma. If you do not do your melanoma markers, you're going to end up in jail. I'm telling you, you're going to miss a melanoma. I'm not joking. This is going to happen if you don't do that. So uh, melanoma and gist. And why gist? Because gist, it's it's well known to go to liver. It's probably the number one place that gist likes to go. It's to the liver. Okay. And remember, gist also has multiple faces, right? The epithelioid, the spinal, the mixed, the schwannoma path, all of that. So anyways, everything else, like, you know, neurotumor, melanomas, you know, lyomyomas, everything, muscle markers, everything was negative. So then we left, okay, uh, you know what? Uh, let's do a, if I can't find it in my bad vision here. What is the, uh, we did a CD117 and was negative, which is the secret. So what are you going to do next? Yes, yes, that's a good one. That's a good, perfect approach. So what happened is that um, if you have something that it's uh, CD117 and it's spindle, don't let this fool you because, again, you're going to be missing to make the diagnosis. So this was a CD, um, uh, CD117 negative, positive dog one, just. So if you stop right there, you're not going to make the diagnosis, right? So this was a good um, catch. We thought good that you just you didn't even care about the one on seven. You just went into the dog one. <laughs> you guys are great because you guys are like you know don't BS me. Just give me you know the right stain. I don't want to waste my time, Tony. So um, this is a cool case also. This was supposed to be liver, but you know they just get to the surface you know, the peri liver or, you know, soft tissue. And look what we have here. But this is supposed to be a liver uh, metastasis, okay? Do you want to describe? Is this epithelial or mosaic? Well, again, do this this kind of thing. Is this a neoplastic process, yes or no? Is this epithelial or mosaic malignant or not? Okay, so what do you think? For those that like the uh, nuclear inclusions. If I can stop, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah. 
epithelio, mesenchymal, none of them. The others, remember that I told lymphomas, neuroendocrine, melanomas, just then you go into that category. It's typically looking, but probably it's not epithelial. <laughs> it's a good way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way because to see things with fire. Yeah. I mean, there are pigments. Sometimes looks like having pigment. I'm not sure what kind of pigment? Brown pigment. That's that's like yeah. Pigment. That's perfect. What you're doing. You're using your HE tools to make to order your stains. Okay. We assuming that you know we don't have history in these patients, right? And that's before you order your stain to say okay. Then you got the history. Then it's easier. But you're doing exactly what you know you're supposed to do. You look in the case and say, well, it's got this ep epithelioid-ish look to it, but it probably it's not. You see all these features like these very bizarre malignant cells, prominent nucleoli. Then you see boom, pigment. Every time that I can fit in anything, I look for my pigments. Do you know, I look for my mucins when I see like abnormal carcinoma. Is this a luminal mucin or this is a, a cellular mucin? Like for instance, uh, uh, prostate, it's luminal mucin. Um, thyroid, it's cellular mucin. So all these kind of things help you in terms of making a diagnosis. So this is one of the cases that you're gonna look, you know, for brown pigment, and you're looking and say, this is brown pigment. You know, this is big, this is melanin. What I'm gonna order? I'm gonna order my S100s and you know everything else. So you have S100, you have HMB45, and you have pen melanin. I mean melan uh, melanin, which is uh, positive right and uh this is melanoma so this patient had um a uveal melanoma uveal melanomas sometimes they're not found until you find the metastasis so eye melanoma goes to lung and liver if you have lung and liver if you have no history of melanoma tell the guy to check the eyes because that's where they're coming from okay so that's the way to go uh i have two more i know it's Five minutes past nine, but I'm very excited to finish. <laughs> so whether you want it or not, even if you leave, I'm gonna be my, by myself here. You're not gonna kick me out and I'm gonna finish. There's no way that I'm not finishing. So look at this. This is a, a trick one in the sense that, who's gonna take this one? You. Yeah. Um, this is liver. <laughs> Probably tired of me. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's just like pattern of um, remember this ad nausea and ad vomitum because I'm going to be repeating some of the same diagnosis, different patterns. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of playing off this. I want to jump to the stains, but I'm not supposed to. Uh, not yet. Come, come up with your uh, differential. You know, like, yeah. If you have, you know, if you want to order the stains, you need to come up with your differential. So you're seeing like bizarre cells with multinucleated. Uh, some of them do have um, um, internuclear inclusions, right? Mm -hmm. Also, um, and I don't know if you, if uh, I'm getting out away from the area that I wanted to show. That's funny, not funny, ha ha ha, right? <laughs> Annoying. But again, um, I'm looking for when I see these in liver, I'm looking for pigment. I don't see bile, I don't see um, brown pigment, but still, I think that, you know, ugly things happen with melanoma. So, again, I'm just, you know, trying to cut this short, but every time you see cells like these, giant cells, multinucleated, bizarre, prominent nucleoli, internuclear inclusion, think of melanoma, again. So melanoma is going to be your first differential here, and this was, again, a um, melanoma. This patient had a history of melanoma, um, skin melanoma. So it's different pattern from the prior one, right? This one is more like a very bizarre, malignant uh, type. And I have one more, which is this cool case here. And I promise I'll let you go. 
I know you have to work. I don't have to. But. Who's you? You've been talking all the time, so now you're gonna like you know officially be there. How rude I am, right? I just say you without asking the name, but <laughs> come on. It's, it's this could be like so every time you think about lymphoid, lymphoma, or whatever, you also think about pretty different shit for normal lymphoma, and also I would include melanoma, right? Yeah. So this is kind of tough because it's pretty much like predominantly necrotic, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which tells me also that this is kind of malignant, right? <laughs> we don't have invasion here, but we have this necrotic thing. This cannot be benign, right? You know, if you have anything that is necrotic, Necrotic, don't tell me it's benign. I mean, sometimes benign things may give necrosis, but usually not. So, any any guess besides the uh, lymphoid uh, thing? Could be like other small ones in the cell. The cells are visible, so not like a bacteria. Uh huh. Could this be a gist? Could be. Because gist goes to. To liver, right? Hey, what the heck, right? Let's put in a CD one one seven, right? I mean, hey, we are all work in America. It's rich country. We can get everything we wanted. So, <laughs> right? CD one one seven. Look at this, positive. Yeah. So it's what. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool one. Just That's next cool one. Uh, CD one seven one slide. That's it. <laughs> and somebody walks in and said, "Hmm, have you ordered a melanate?" And they're like, "Oh, why this person walked in my office just to make my life miserable <laughs> and ask me to order melanate?" How would you explain that? Oh. <laughs> melanoma, why? So melanomas can be positive for CD117. CD117 yeah. is not characteristic of GIST. It helps you in the appropriate context. But melanomas, lymphoid things can be uh, uh, CK positive, germ cells, mast cells. Um, when I was at Yale, we had a case, my, my fellow uh, published uh, in the end, I was not part of it for whatever reason. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 published without me, but it was a very interesting case because for sign out as um, um, just for an outside institution, so they gave glee back to this patient. This patient never improved. But we are alive, I'm saying Yale. Uh, obviously, the institution, so probably not is broadcasted. But anyways, um, so uh, this this case was, you know, like signed as a back uh, as a, a gist, and patient had back never improved. And then, you know, it was sent to us uh, in consultation, and um, we decided to do the um, melanoma walkers. And then we discovered that the patient had um, melanoma. So it was a CK positive. And then, you know, with the melanoma markers being positive, then the patient had a resection and was like a primary colonic uh, melanoma, so which is very rare. You don't have a primary melanoma, so you need to exclude everything else because melanomas in the GI tract, they are only in the, you know, like mouth, I mean, esophagus and anus. You don't have colonic. But, you know, certain, you know, people, they say that, you know, throughout the embryogenesis, all these melanoma sites or, or is in you know the cell, the same cell may be left in the colon and then can give rise to, to melanomas. So basically, um, um, you know, one of the things that you have to think is uh, every time you have a um, uh, case that looks like a gist, and you know, like this didn't look like, but you include it because it's part of your you know workout thing. So once you you start like you know looking at cases like this. Uh, do not forget about melanoma ever. Every time you have something that looks like spindle or bizarre and it can fit in anything, include a melanoma marker. Do not stop there just because you found that you know your CD one one seven is positive. You know, in cases like that, it's not typical. Include your melanoma marker, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. 
So always think about these cases like this. Epithelial, you have your you know, differential, mesenchymal, you have your list of differential. Again, you have to think of melanoma just and your other sarcomas, you know, high-grade sarcomas and everything else. Um, that's what I have for you today. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Yes. Yeah, I think you know. The, I, I think the melanoma by itself, you know, yeah, that, that all this, makes sense. So, yeah. just the cell. Just you don't.